Hey everybody, welcome to Providence Church. What a joy it is to be together today. I have a few exciting things to tell you about, and if you'd like to follow along, I invite you to go to prov.church slash program. Our spring care night series will begin on Tuesday, April 12th with a new round of classes with both in-person and online options. If you've ever felt stuck in life or wondered what God has in store for you, check out the list of classes being offered this spring. We'll discover how even in the midst of those feelings, God has been at work and has made each of us unique and for a purpose. Do you have a heart for foster families? Foster 180 is a new ministry partner right here in Wilson County that partners with local churches to raise awareness and create care teams to support foster families in our community. If you'd like to be a part of the good work they are doing, you can learn more and receive volunteer training on Sunday, May 1st at 12 p.m. To register for Foster 180 training and Care Night, you can click the images in the program. Well, Providence students, Wake is this Sunday, so middle and high school students come gather together at the church at 6 p.m., which is a little later than normal because you'll be having a flashlight Easter egg hunt. It's going to be a great time of fun, food, and worship. If you came prepared to give a financial gift today, there are a few ways on the screen in which you can do that or click give in the program. If you're a first time guest, we are delighted that you're here. We've been praying for you and hope you feel the presence of God in this place today. Welcome to church. Hey everybody, we're so glad to see you here tonight on this Thursday night. Thank you for coming to worship, to lift your heart to God, to join us in prayer, to join us in worship. Our prayer is that this time would be a time that our hearts would come together, they would join together before God lift up the name of Jesus, exalt the name of Jesus, to remember who we are, who made us, who's with us, who's for us. I want to invite you to stand. And just give your heart to this time in worship. Give your heart to what God is going to do in this place tonight. We believe that the Spirit of God is going to move as we praise Him and He will come and meet us and do what we could never have asked or imagined. Let's hear these words from the Psalms. This is Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Would you say that last line with me? The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Amen. Let's worship God together. Ciao. 
center of your church and every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess you Let's pray. Jesus, 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 Jesus. You are the Savior of the world and you are Lord over our hearts. So receive, we pray, our uh, attention, our adoration, uh, our devotion. We give ourselves to you in this moment, King Jesus. We pause in prayer to turn our minds and our hearts to the one who created all that is in existence, the one who was before and the one who is now and the one who will be forever, Jesus. We are in awe of you, God. We are uh, in wonder at who you are and that you have chosen to meet with us in this time. So meet with us, we pray. We want you here, God. We want you in our midst. We desire your presence. We're hungry for your word. We're in need of help. And so we pray to you now, lifting up our concerns, the people that we love, the names that are on the tip of our tongue, the burdens that we carry, the anxieties for tomorrow, We bring them before you, God, and know that you are meeting us here and that you receive our prayers. We pray especially for our world. Um, We pray for Ukraine and the war uh, that has um, afflicted this country. We pray for uh, the peace talks that we pray are taking place even now. We pray for those who are who are in the midst of uh, meetings that could mean the salvation of lives. And so we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit for peace, for wisdom, uh, for clarity, and ultimately, God, for an end to a war that is taking the lives of innocent people. We pray against the evil powers of this world and in the heavenly realms that seek to come against and and kill and steal and destroy. And we stand in confidence as the people of God who pray on the behalf of those who may not even be able to voice a prayer at this time. Thank you, God, for letting us be a part of the church, the church uh, uh, universal that can come together on behalf of those who are in need. We lift our our very needs to you, God, even as we pray. And we join our voices together. I invite you to pray with me uh, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. It's great to be with you. My name's Jacob. If we haven't had a chance to meet, I'm so thankful to have just a few moments with you to share with you from the Bible, uh, to continue a study of the book of John that has captivated our hearts and to see what God has to say to us tonight. I do want to let you know uh, three things that are upcoming in the next couple of weeks because it's a really exciting time in the life of the church. Next Sunday, Sunday, April the 10th, we will have our Providence Kids egg hunt. Those will be taking place after all three of the Sunday services. So just want to make sure y'all were aware of that. Following that, if you'll travel with me through time into the future, uh, on a Thursday night, not next Thursday, but the next one, uh, the Thursday before Easter, April 14th, we'll be having a very special service on Thursday night called the Holy Thursday service. And it's one you don't want to miss. It's a great way to prepare your heart for Easter as we will hear the entire story of Jesus going to the cross, his crucifixion, and his death a part you really don't want to miss before you get to Easter. So I just encourage y'all, we'll we'll lift that up again. I want you to know about that. And then we've been letting you know about Easter. We have five services that weekend, two on Saturday and three on Sunday. We would love uh, for you to be with us. Of course, we'd love for you to join us on one of the Saturday night services if you can to make room on Sunday. And we would like to invite you to sign up to register your spot at prov.church slash Easter. That's just a way of, again, helping us make a bunch of room for what we anticipate will be a lot of people on our biggest day. So make plans to join us on Easter. We're in John chapter five tonight. This is our 10th week in the study of the book of John. We've made it all the way to chapter five. And I can't wait to tell you this story and and allow yourself to situate in the story that John is telling about the miracles of Jesus. Remembering that John puts in his book seven miracles as as sort of the pillars for how he's gonna tell us about this Jesus who has come to be the Messiah, the one who will save the people from their sins. And if we believe in him, we'll have life in his name. So John chapter five, verse one starts this way. It says, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. I knew this would excite you. I brought back the map. And on the map, you will see up at the top, Cana uh, in the northern part around the Sea of Galilee and down south, Jerusalem. If you've been following along in the book of John, and if you haven't, I'm going to tell you what's happened. The book of John starts in John chapter two with the first miracle, water into wine that takes place in this place called Cana. But after that miracle, Jesus goes south to Jerusalem. Now, oftentimes it will say Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. We would say Jesus goes down to Jerusalem. Don't get too confused by that. For them, it was a geographical, or I guess a topographical kind of thing that they were going up in elevation. So for us, we'll just say Jesus went down to Jerusalem. He turns over the tables in the temple. He meets with Nicodemus. He goes back up, meets with a Samaritan woman in a place called Sychar, and then he goes back to Cana. In Cana, the second miracle happens, and this was this amazing miracle where a royal official comes to Jesus from this place called Capernaum on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. He walks all the way to Cana to tell Jesus that his son is sick and he's going to die, and Jesus heals the royal official's boy when they're standing in Cana, and the boy is back in Capernaum. Amazing, right? And then Jesus goes back to Jerusalem. This is his pattern, right? Up here is where he lives, but they go down to Jerusalem oftentimes for these religious festivals. And that's what Jesus has done in this story. Verse two says, and now there is in Jerusalem, now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. So it's the pool of Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Now, I know that sounds kind of different, but you can start to try to picture what that might look like in your mind. Um, It it was just a pool of water that sat outside, just outside of the walls of the temple, but still in the walls of the city of the holy city of Jerusalem. And there were these five covered colonnades, which are sort of like porticos, just kind of a covered place where people could sit in the shade. Verse three says, here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. The blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. So there was a place in Jerusalem in this bustling city where lots of people were, that the people who couldn't walk, the people who couldn't get to where they were supposed to be, the people who couldn't see, they would gather there and they would gather on the ground. Some of you who are from large cities or maybe have been to large cities, you've seen places in large cities where people who can't get to where they need to get sort of congregate and sit. And so that's what was happening here. But 
we, we sort of wonder why, why here by the pool of Bethesda? And verse four is an interesting verse that tells us the why. I'm pointing out verse four specifically though, because if you were looking at your Bible right now, you might see that your Bible goes from verse three to verse five. Very interesting. And the reason is, is most people think this verse four was added at some time later than the earliest manuscripts that become our Bible. Aren't you encouraged to know that the people who have formed your Bible and put it together are trying to make sure that it is the most accurate text that they could give you as they translate it. And so the folks who translate over time say verse four probably came a bit later, but we still want you to know what verse four says. And the reason is, is because later in the story, you will see that the people in the story believe verse four. Believe, you understand what I'm saying? I don't either really, but here we go. Verse four says, from time to time, why were they by the pool? From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. There was an angel. I almost said there was a belief that there was an angel, but we believe in things, right? There was an angel. A friend of mine told me the story. He was at the pool of Bethesda and somebody raised their hand and they said, they asked their Jewish guide, this uh, woman who had grown up in the city and her grandparents had grown up in the city and her great grandparents. And, they, and she asked, she said, why was it that they thought uh, that an angel came and stirred the water? Why did they believe that? And the, the guide said, an angel came and stirred the water. That's why they believed it, okay? <laughs> and so an angel would come and stir the water and if you could be first, so you gotta be watching the water. And if you could be first out of all these blind and lame and paralyzed people, if you could be the first to get into the water, you would be healed. The next verse says, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Hmm. There's a bunch of people there, but one had been there 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, the man who'd been an invalid for 38 years, do you want to get well? And this is what the man said. He said, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. That's why we know verse four had something to do with it, okay? I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. He couldn't ever get there on time. He couldn't ever be uh, in the right time. And so for this man, no healing, 38 years. Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And get this, at once. The man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The man who had been unable to walk for 38 years now walks the third miracle in the book of John. I've been thinking a lot about miracles. I know that many of you have. I have received more messages, emails, texts, voicemails than I have ever received in a series. And what I have taken from that is you, like me, are praying for miracles. I get a lot of th uh, emails saying, this is what I'm praying for. This is the miracle I'm praying for. Praying for miracles. Uh, there are those of us who are believing in miracles. So that's another message that I, that I get commonly. It says, I believe in miracles. And then the other thing that I've noticed is that we are, our, our, our church, we are wrestling a bit with miracles, wrestling a bit with the notion of how this works and what's going on. And so this is my assessment of all of our comments about miracles just over the last week. Most of us are wrestling. Much of our wrestling with miracles is about timing. And I'll explain. Much of the questions that come up about miracles can, can be summed up in a question of timing. So the question of miracles that I'm hearing mostly is not so much a question of how, uh, because it's sort of like, we're going to believe in God, how God, God can do what God does. You know, I don't know how exactly how he does it. It's just not the question we, we get tied up in. I haven't heard so much the question of where 
Two weeks ago when I preached about that boy being healed in Capernaum while his dad was over in Cana, I didn't have one person ask me, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about the where that Jesus was over in Cana and somehow he can do something uh, over in Capernaum? People didn't really struggle. It didn't seem like we struggled too much with the where. Uh, you know, the what, I guess, could be something, but I haven't heard so much about what's going on here, what is God up to. Now, why? We'll pause on why for a moment, won't we? The question of why is one of the big ones that comes up, and that is, why that kid and not my kid? I've heard that one. Um, you know, why them and not me? Why 38 years in and not 38 days in? And so what I've noticed is that the why question is really sort of why not now, the why is, is like, I don't get it. Like, I need this now. So when we struggle with miracles, it's sort of like, why not now? And guys, why not now is really a question of when. It's a question of timing. Because as believers, as folks who've heard the end of the story in resurrection, we actually believe that there's a good miracle coming for all of us, that all of us one day physically will not be able to stay in the game. And there's this miracle coming. And so our struggle with miracles is about timing. It's like, I'm in this moment. Why not now or when, Jesus? This miracle, the miracle at the pool, is all about time. And that's why we should pay special attention to it. It's about a guy who knows way too much about what I would call the struggle of a long time and the struggle of the wrong times. So a lot of our struggle with time is that we wait for so long. Well, 38 years he waited. How about 38 years of being carried around? How about 38 years of lying on the ground? The scripture says that Jesus learned that he had been in this condition for a long time. But it wasn't just a struggle of a long time for the man. It was also a struggle of the wrong time, that he could never quite be on time at the right time for the healing. He was always at the wrong time. He was never the one that got to the water first. He was never on time. And I have a truth for you tonight, and it is this. You won't always be on time. You won't always be on time. I see people elbowing people out there. It's not exactly what I mean. But you will have things happen in your life out of your control, and you won't be on time for what you think you need. I was driving my daughter Lydia to volleyball practice the other day. I'm super proud of this kid, by the way. She loves volleyball. She's really into it. She works so hard. She practices multiple days a week. Um, she is really good at getting herself ready for that. She practices at a gym in Franklin. And so before she goes to school, she has to have everything ready, her backpack for school, her homework ready, but also the backpack for volleyball and her clothes for that, her snacks for that. And she's taking care of that. And so this, this day last week was my day to drive. And when she, she was on time, leaving school on time, we got to the house and I punched in my Google Maps, my drive to Franklin, and there was a wreck in Nashville the way that we'd gone. There was gonna be no way that I could get her through that. And so, you know, I did the thing to find another route. And it turns out I could, as I usually turn right to go to the interstate to go through Nashville to Franklin, there was an option that I could turn left. And it was a long time, but it was better than the other one. And so I took it. And so I drove, I live pretty close here to the church. And so I drove this way, if you're familiar with the area, like, uh, past Long Hunter State Park and over the bridge into this place where there's sort of the convergence of Laverne and Antioch. And I kept driving and I came to Nolensville. Who knew you could get to Nolensville that way? And then I got to this area that I think was sort of between Nolensville and I think Brentwood, but it felt like I had, I, I should have already left America. I had been driving so long. I didn't know this area. I didn't recognize it. And the time just kept going on and on and on. I was trying to drive well and get to to where we need to be. And I heard Lydia sitting next to me. She let out this big exhale. She just went, Phew. and I thought maybe she was stressed by my driving. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, I am not going to be on time. And I was like, you know what? You're right. But I said, you know, you did everything you could. 
You had your backpack ready. You left school on time. And I just shared with her. I just said, you know what, Lydia? There are going to be times where you've done all you can and you still won't be on time. And the same is true for you and me. You can do so good in your life. You can plan everything out. You can get everything set up the way that it's supposed to be. But there still will be some things that you won't be on time for, that you won't be at when you think you're supposed to be there. And it's not just that. There's also going to be some things that happen in your life. I won't even attempt to list them. You can do your own inventory where you will think this happened in my life at the wrong time. This thing is happening at the wrong time. I met with someone just today, and they, I mean, and they said it. They said, this is not how I saw this time going in my life. And that leads to another statement that I will offer to you. You got to hang with me, okay? And it is, God won't always seem to be on time. God won't always seem to be on time in your life. I remember when I first started out as a pastor, I don't know why they let me be a pastor when I was 20 years old or 21 years old, but they did. And I didn't really know much about anything. And, and I was at church one Sunday and this older lady, this sweet older lady who I loved, and I knew her husband was sick. And I knew he was in a difficult situation. And she came to me and she asked me if I would pray for her. And I said, I will pray for you. And I don't really think I said the wrong thing, but I'll tell you kind of what I said in this, this prayer. I still say it today, but I said, I'm praying to God. I'm talking to God, but I'm holding this lady's hand and she's got her head bowed. And, and I said, God, you know, I know you tell us in the Bible that we can ask, we can ask for what we need and we can, we can ask for it in Jesus' name. And I said, so I'm asking you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a big ask. And, I'm gonna, and I, I didn't even get to ask out of my mouth and that lady put her finger on the bottom of my chin and she lifted my head up. And she said, young man, I have already asked. And she said, and asked and asked and asked and asked. I'll never forget it. And I realized what she was telling to me. This is a good moment between a pastor and a parishioner because they teach you. And she was saying to me, right now in my life, God does not seem to be on time. We wrestle with when, don't we? We wrestle with the timing. And so, Let's look at what Jesus does for a man who is in the same time that we are in, who understands the struggle of a long time and the wrong time. Instead of trying to figure out all the time, let's see what Jesus says to the man who's in the time, all right? So here's Jesus' question to the man. You already heard it, but he asks, do you want to get well? Jesus asked a man who's been laying on the ground for 38 years, would you like to get better? Would you like to walk? And I've been thinking about this. Did you know that you could, um, um, after you've laid somewhere for a long time, even if it isn't that great of a place to lay, you may have the option to do something else and you may choose to keep lying there just because you're used to it. Of course, we see this in like situations of addiction. It's like, you want to be made well? It's like, I want to be made well, but it's hard to, uh, do I really want to be made well? Or, or an unhealthy relationship, right? Do you really, do you want to get out of this? Do you want this thing to change? Yeah. I've been trying to eat healthier uh, for like a day or two. Uh, it's been a goal of mine. But what I need you to know is I, I well, let me, I'll try to say it this way. I know that Taco Bell makes me feel bad afterwards, right? And I keep finding myself in the drive-thru. It's a crazy thing. And I know, I know, I'm confessing this. I know Taco Bell makes me feel bad, but sometimes you can get used to something that you say you want to get rescued from. If you see me in the Taco Bell drive-thru, okay, you might holler out like, hey, Pastor Jacob, you said the other night you don't want to do that anymore. I will pretend that I don't know you, you know, <laughs> but you got the wrong guy because I'm really not sure how bad I want to get well. I say it a lot, but based on kind of what I'm doing, I'm not really sure how bad I want to get well. You can get used to feeling bad when things have been going on for a long time. 38 years was a long time, and Jesus asked me, he says, I have a question for you. Do you want to get well? 
And here's, here's the guy's answer. He says, you don't understand. He says, every time the water gets stirred, he can't walk. He's like, every time the water gets stirred, I try to make my way over there, but I'm never the first one to the water. Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? And he says, I can't get to the water. I mean, he's, he's really, he's trying to answer the question, but Jesus didn't ask him, why aren't you better yet? He asked him, do you want right now to be the right time for your life? Do you want to get well? And here's the cool thing, guys. Jesus isn't trying to trick him around or pull. Jesus heals him in the moment because his heart was moved when he saw him and how long he had been laying there. It says, Jesus says to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. And it says, at once the man was cured. He picks up his mat and walks. After 38 years, suddenly the long wait is over. We have the third miracle in the book of John. The first miracle, hang with me. The first miracle is in John chapter two. It's water into wine. Jesus is moved by his mother saying that there's not any more wine at the party. It's like when, uh, you know, when a mother says to a kid, the dishes are still in the dishwasher. No question was asked of Jesus, right? But he knew that he needed to do something. But it's interesting when his mom says to him, when his mom is imploring him to, to do a miracle in this moment, do you know what Jesus says? He says, my time has not yet come. He makes a reference to timing. And so the miracle happens when the people feel, fill the containers with water, but the miracle really happens when they dip uh, the ladle or whatever in and wine comes out. So the miracle is experienced when the people act in faith in that moment. That's the first miracle. The second miracle, we spent a lot of time on it, but this man's son is healed, but the man doesn't know when it happens. He finds out that there was this precise timing thing that happened. So time is a part of it, right? Time is a part of the miracle that while he was talking to Jesus, the boy was healed, but he does not find out about it until he acts in accordance to what Jesus has asked him to do. He doesn't experience the miracle until he's already walking in faith. Our miracle tonight is this third miracle, a man who can't walk, he's healed. But you see, he experiences the healing when he begins to act in accordance with what Jesus says. So there is a developing pattern in these three miracles. We're going to go through seven over the course of a year. In these three miracles, there's a pattern where there is a misunderstanding and confusion and mystery around timing. What's going on with the timing? But there is something miraculous that happens when they listen to Jesus and go where he tells them to go. John begins his book. We're studying the whole book, all right? John begins his book with this statement. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 2 says, through him All things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Why am I going back to this? Because John is setting up his book by saying, Jesus comes before all things. Everything was made through him. Anything you see was created by Jesus who came at the very very beginning. And then there are prayers like this in the New Testament. I'm skipping to just a random verse in the New Testament, but there's several kind of benediction prayers like this. This is from the book of Jude. And it says this, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. I know I'm all over the place, but just give me a couple more minutes, okay? You're not, you're not gonna believe what I'm about to say. Einstein's theory of relativity which is way over my head, but it can be boiled down in its most simplest form to this. Creation, matter, space, the things that you can see always coexist with time. They're coextensive, which means you can't have time without creation. You can't experience matter and space uh, separated from time and you can't experience time without creation. I don't really understand it either. I Googled uh, a theory of relativity for dummies and that's what it said. And so if we believe that Jesus is before 
everything that is created, all matter, all space, Jesus comes before all that. This means as we struggle in time, we know that we have a God that comes before time, who is over time, and then here's the miracle. He chooses to enter into the time, which is why. There will, of course, be moments when we don't really understand everything that's going on with the timing of our life because we aren't God. We didn't come before it. We're not over it. So instead of paying attention to all the faults in our timing, we are being asked to pay attention to the one who was before time and over time and in our time. And that God who's walking around in our time is not asking us to figure out all the different timing of our lives, all the long times and the wrong times. That appears to be a part of the human condition. That appears to be a part of what we will experience in this life. But what that God does when he's walking around, he comes up to people who've been laying on the ground for a long time and he says, do you want to be made well. He asks a question that pulls them out of the predicament of their time to see him before him and then gives them an invitation to walk in accordance to what he says. I am not promising you a physical miracle. I am promising you that there is a miracle when you walk in accordance to what Jesus says when you are pulled out of that time. So the timing will not always make sense, but if you trust Jesus, you can trust the timing. I wept when I wrote that this week, okay? Because I understand what that means. But if you trust Jesus, you can trust the timing that you're in, that he is working, that he's before it, that he's over it, and that he's in it. So let us just receive the question from Jesus now. If you'll just bow in prayer, I just want you to hear this question. Do you want to be made well? Be honest. Do you want to stay where you're at? Or do you want more of Jesus in your life? And as you begin to respond in your heart to do you want to be made well, it will lead you to taking some steps of faith towards, I believe, a miracle. Lord, we come to you in the midst of timing that can seem so long so separate from the ones we love, so distant from the things that we hoped for. Some of us, God, are experiencing right now this wrong time feeling. This wasn't supposed to be like this right now. And so we ask God that you would enter in to our place, our condition, meet us and work a miracle. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanna invite you to come to communion as a way of taking some of those steps, all right? So that can be your way of saying, I'm gonna walk in accordance. So I'll receive these words. I've got some words that I'll say, uh, and, and if you'll respond back in the bold, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. If you're helping serve communion, if you come forward now, uh, we're gonna cleanse our hands and they'll prepare some places up front that you can come in just a moment. We're gonna hand you a piece of bread that represents Christ's body and then also give you a little cup of juice uh, representing the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Everyone here is welcome to come to the table of communion. It is open to all, so know that you're welcome to come. And uh, as you come, you'll receive those things. You can just go back to your seat, have a moment, a quiet moment in prayer. 
and then there'll be uh, places that you can take the cups and throw them away as you exit. So uh, all of us in the house tonight, we'll just come to this middle aisle here. You can make your way when you're ready and then come through here. Let us come to the table of the Lord.
what a beautiful morning it has been. As you journey throughout your week, I pray that you're able to recognize Jesus' voice in your life and open your spirit to the miraculous, life-changing words He has for you. If you're a guest with us today, I'd love to meet you in a video Zoom call and personally welcome you to Providence Church. That link should be available for you to click on right now. And if you missed any of our announcements before the service started, go check out prov.church slash program before you head out today so you don't miss anything happening around here. And now, let me send you out with this blessing. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Go in peace.